okay. of your teaching. Well, welcome to class number two for RCIA. Um, there's a few new faces here tonight, and that's great. Uh, I just want to introduce myself, and I'm Father Luke. I am the sophomore priest here at St. Paul's this year with Father Andrew and Father Eric. We are the three priests here at St. Paul's, and there's also a great staff along with us. Uh, Grace is here tonight along with Chris, and they're in the back. Way to us. There we go. And they're going to be helping with RCIA as we go as we go along. So, um, welcome if you're new. It's good to have you here. And what is RCIA? So, big picture for RCIA is that there are three pillars. Okay, there's three pillars that we want to that uphold RCIA. The first is community. Okay, so part of being in RCIA is being in, in community. Right? No one can come to the faith, no one enters the church on their own. And so to that end, some things fall under community. One is getting sponsored, another is going on a retreat, and a Bible study. It's kind of an optional little piece there. These are just, uh, the Bible studies encouraged, the other two are, are kind of um, mandatory, more or less, for uh, RCIA. So the big one is the sponsor, okay? So if you're uh, in looking for a sponsor and, and you need some help, please see me, Grace, or Chris, and we'll be working with you one-on-one -on -one to find you a sponsor, right? Somebody who can be with you, to walk with you through RCIA. Um, so that's a big part of, of your experience in RCIA. Um, the second pillar is the liturgical pillar, meaning that there are some ceremonies that happen, right? Because as good Catholics, we like to have have ceremonies, have some celebrations, because who wouldn't want to celebrate a few things throughout their life? Life would be, it won't be so fun if there were any celebrations, so we've added a few. And the first one is actually not that far away, the first Sunday of Advent. Okay, so that's the first one we're looking at. That would be, I think actually December 1st. It could be Sunday. Uh, December 2nd, thank you. All right, so that is the first uh, ceremony that we'll have, and it's going to be the rite of welcoming. The right of welcoming, and from from now until that date, I hope all of you are thinking about whether or not you want to be there on December second and be welcomed as a candidate or as a catechumen to enter the Catholic Church. Right. So right now, there's no real labels for anyone here besides a human person made in the image and likeness of God. Because that's what we're going for that one. But um, after December 2nd, you would be a catechumen if you are unbaptized. If you are unbaptized and you are welcome on December 2nd, you become a catechumen. And then if you are already baptized uh, but not received into the church, you would be a candidate. A candidate. Same thing if you're just not confirmed. You'd be referred to as a candidate, but not yet. Not until December Second, because that's that first, that first ceremony. Okay, and lastly, the third pillar of RCIA is catechetical, meaning what we're doing right now tonight, our class and our learning. Okay, and tonight we have a fair amount of material, so um, we're going to start with our prayers and get right into it. Um, we also have a syllabus, syllabus in front of you. Um, this is the outline for everything. Everything until the Easter Vigil, okay? So hopefully we can stick to this, and I try to take into account winter break and Thanksgiving and all that. So if there's any mistakes that are on here, I will adjust it. Um, I, I took, like, for instance, we're not going to have class during finals week, um, stuff like that. So uh, hopefully this works out, and uh, we'll stick to it as best as we can. Okay, so our prayer. So let's stand as we always do and recite our prayer. And as I mentioned last week, if you'd like to make the sign of the cross and you're new to it, you're welcome to make the sign of the cross. Um, just kind of watch me as I do it and you can sort of imitate me. It's probably the best way. Uh, and then we'll, we'll recite both of these prayers out loud together. Okay? In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Almighty God, unto whom all hearts be open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts, 
by the inspiration of thy Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love thee and worthily magnify thy holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Grant me grace, O merciful God, to desire ardently all that is pleasing to thee, to examine it prudently, to acknowledge it truthfully, and to accomplish it perfectly. For the praise and glory of thy name. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay, first is to recap what we talked about last week. If you missed last week, there's a video on our YouTube channel which I figured out the other day. It's pretty cool. We've got a YouTube channel. And then there's a little quiz that goes with that video. So if you missed last week, all you gotta do is watch that video and then take the quiz. Uh, hopefully it's open to everyone, and it's a really short quiz, and it's just to kind of make sure that you watch the video, give you something to, um, to keep your, your mind attentive as you, as you watch the video. Um, so that will come out in an email if you are new. Okay, we'll get you that in an email. But that's, uh, last week, what did we do? We talked about man's search for God. Right? There's two ways that we could have begun. We could have begun with God searching for man or man searching for God. And we did exactly what the catechism does, and that is it begins with man's search for God. And we did that because, well, we're all, we're all humans. We have the experience of being a human person, and so that's closest to us. Right? Our experience of God may be different for everyone. But there's a common experience that we all have, and that's our experience of being a human person. Right? So we began with man's search for God, which is what, this is what the Catechism does. Right? Uh, we talked about how we all worship something. Right? We are uh, human beings with desires, with hearts. And then we moved on to um, the discussion of revelation and reason. Right? Man searching for God. And we talked about how it is reasonable to be open to revelation and unreasonable to be closed. Right? Because how could we ever know God unless he stepped toward us? Right? So the experience of the smallness of our intellects, the, the darkening of our intellects, means that we should be open, just to un, unreason alone, to God's revelation to him stepping towards us. And lastly, uh, man's situation. Right? We stand in need. Right? By our own efforts, we struggle to know who God is. Right? Uh, there's no child genius who has discovered you know, who God is. No, we took God stepping toward us. Right? And we needed God to reveal himself. And that was um, man's search for God. And today, we're going to kind of stay with that. Uh, the title of today's class is called The Holiness. And that title um, will probably make more sense at the end, okay? At the beginning of today's class, we're going to stick in, in man's search for God, and then we'll, we'll get to um, sort of the call to holiness piece towards the end. But I think it'll, it'll tie together nicely. And we ended last week with the idea that there are many religions, right? There are many ways that man has searched for God. Right? I'm, sure, I'm sure you've experienced a few of them, uh, especially in a place like Madison. Right, You can go around and, and see people of various religions or various worship sites. Right? And so it's a, it's, a, it's a phenomenon that's right at our, our fingertips here. Um, and this is true not just now, but all throughout history. All throughout history, man has sought after God in various ways. And there's um, I've never studied this, but there's there's a um, a body of study called the philosophy of religions, and the basic thesis that I will take from that, and most of this comes from a book called Truth and Tolerance by Joseph Ratzinger. Uh, the basic thesis is that religions have developed throughout history. They have, they have progressed. They have progressed. Um, history is not static. 
right? It, it changes. The human person has developed. And if you're into biology, I mean, you, you, you're, all, you're all on board with this, right? Uh, even the idea of evolution, right, points towards this. That history uh, is not static, but it, it makes progress. And you can see this even in, even in religion. Uh, and Joseph Ratzinger, the author of, of this book, does anyone know who uh, he became after he was Joseph Ratzinger? Dorian? Pope Benedict XVI. Pope Benedict XVI, right. So he's still living, still, still living, one of my favorite authors. You know, if you're having a bad day, just pick up Ratzinger. Dave's totally his bad day. He's a driver. Um, and he puts together this, uh, this outline uh, to sort of summarize the philosophy of, of religion. Okay. First stage in this historical progress is man's primitive and scattered experience. Right? Really no organized religion at this point, just various um, experiences of, of nature, of um, finitude, things like that. Death, birth, and the basic experience of life. And then there's the, there's the second stage of trying to make sense of all this. <coughs> Um, how do we make sense of our experience? And the human person has done this through, uh, much it through myth, through mythical religions. And in the last stage, there's three ways of moving beyond myths, um, mysticism, monotheistic revolutions, and enlightenment. And so we'll be sticking with this diagram, kind of going into it, right, to discover um, what man has done, what we've done, Searching for God and how how we it's very interesting how we try to do this. Okay, so first is, is myth. Right? What does myth mean? Uh, it just means story. That's it. Like a myth is a story, right? There's a there's the uh, the myths that um, I will focus on most are the ones in the Greco-Roman paganism, right? The Greek myth. Right? Anyone here in uh, Classical studies. <coughs> That's, well, I didn't do it here, but I, 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 if I could, it would be fun. But anyways, we all know a little bit about it, right? We know a little bit about Homer, Hesiod, um, the Greeks, right? They were the ones who had the great myths, right? To try to make sense of their experience, right? And they, um, in a sense, um, focused on. The, the beauty of, of these stories more than the truth, right? Uh, the truth itself was not necessarily uh, the principal component of, of myths. As we see here, the, the pagan orator Symmachus, he says, what does it matter with, 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 which, with what philosophy each individual seeks the truth? It is not possible to reach so great a secret by a single group. Right? So there's various myths, myths, right? Lots of them. Because they thought that, well, this is the way to make sense of experience. The truth itself, how could, how could we ever get there by a single root? So we have a, a, a paganism, right? A many uh, gods, many myths, and many ways to, to reach uh, sense. Right, to make meaning out of our lives. And this worked pretty well. Right? It did provide for many, many centuries of stability and peace in the, in the Greek and Roman worlds. Okay? Uh, again, myths have beauty, but not necessarily truth. Uh, the Greek worldview was uh, tragic. Right? The gods were very much anthropomorphic, right? having human traits and human um, emotions and fighting with each other. Right? It was tragic, it was violent, and there was also the idea that, that you were ruled by fate. Right? It was a bit fatalistic. Okay? Now, in the Greek world, um, there was a critique of, of myth that took place. Right, this is a very important moment. 
right? This comes with the philosophers. So here we have a picture of a very smart philosopher. I think his name is Socrates. So, and he's pretty awesome. Pretty awesome beard. If you have a beard, you, you're definitely smarter. I think. <laughs> but here's here's the, the philosopher Xenophanes in the sixth century. Homer and Hesiod have attributed to the gods everything that is a shame and reproach among men. Right, so the philosophers are coming onto the scene, they're looking at all the myths, and they're saying, um, that isn't true. That isn't true. Right? Plato himself, in the Republic, he says, there's an old quarrel between philosophy and poetry. There's an old quarrel between philosophy and poetry. Aristotle, the poets have portrayed the gods mythically for reasons of political expediency and rhetorical persuasion. Right, so the philosophers come onto the scene and they choose not myth but reason. Right, not myth but reason. This is a very, this is a very critical step in the in the development of religion. Right, this critique of, of myth. Okay, now, this critique of myth could be um, put here under, under enlightenment, right? Um, Joseph Ratzinger said there's three ways of moving beyond myths, and we're going to jump right to, to this one, because this is the most similar to what the Greeks, what the Greeks did, okay? Um, they, they emphasized ras rational knowledge over religion. Right? Uh, this started with the Greek philosophers as we just saw, Plato, Aristotle, all of them. But this is also prevalent today, right? Uh, I think rationality uh, is, is very much in, uh, in vogue. Um, you know, the new atheists kind of, uh, they sound a little bit like um, Plato. Because if you, if, you, if you know who they are, this kind of group of authors, who came out with a lot of books critiquing religion. And they often are comparing Jesus to Zeus, right? the, the god of the Christians, to, to um, Poseidon, or you know, all the, the Greek gods. But that's kind of what, uh, what basically what Plato did. I mean, Plato was critiquing uh, Zeus and, and the others. And so there's a lot of, there's a lot of similarities to, to the new atheists today and to the, to the Greek philosophers of old, as far as their critique of, of religion. Right, I saw this bumper sticker on uh, Madison. You know, there's like a whole, I want to do a whole homily series on bumper stickers. <laughs> and Madison is pretty awesome. But, you know, the science, it's true whether you believe it or not. Right? Science, it's true whether you believe it or not. And I was thinking, I could just put Christianity in there. <laughs> yeah. I could just put that on my bumper. <coughs> wow, okay. Anyway, so uh, science is true whether you believe it or not, right? So the Enlightenment way, it looks at myth and religion, it wants to move beyond it, and it sets up this 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 um, absolute value on scientific knowledge. So if, if there's knowledge, it has to be scientific. Right? That's kind of the the Enlightenment uh, uh, idea, at least in, in today's, uh, and, and even, I think even in the Greeks as well, right? rationality is the, the absolute uh, value. Okay. So yeah, I think we should have a little competition to find the best bumper sticker. It does make you think, I mean, I'll, give, I'll give this person credit, I had to think about this for a little while. Um, Okay. All right, now, uh, another way to move beyond myth is <coughs> to get rid of all the stories, right? get rid of all of the, the, the myths, and just rely on, on your inner experience, your personal experience. Right? And this is the way of the mystics, right? mysticism. And this says that experience is greater than myth. Right? Um, now, what is what is mysticism? Um, this would be probably the, the Asian religions, right? Buddhism um, and other types of uh, mystic 
uh, religions, um, and a certain pantheism as well. Right? And this way of getting beyond myth relies on the human person's ability to, to be mystical, right? to know um, God. Not just to know God, but actually to become God. Right? The mystic um, is set up as a person who is sort of the enlightened one, one who knows everything. And then everyone else kind of falls in behind the mystic. Uh, but as this develops in mysticism, it even gets beyond distinctions. There's no longer a distinction between between God and the world. Right? And that's the sort of pantheism. God is the world. So the mystic says, the mystic turns to God and says, uh, you know, I, I am you. I am God. Right? Not I am of you. Yeah, that's kind of the mystic mystic uh, way of moving beyond myth. Uh, and in this, in this realm, God is passive. Uh, it's not God who acts, but the human person who acts. That he reaches various levels of, of mystic experience. Uh, and this, this type of uh, moving beyond myth is, is not historical, but symbolic. It doesn't rely on historical events but rather the inner experience and it relies on, on symbols. And in that way it is it is similar to, to myths. Okay. Uh, now, there's another way that man has tried to search for God beyond, beyond the stories of myths. And this is what Rossinger calls monotheistic revolution. Right? Myth is rejected because it's a creation of man. Right? And in a monotheistic revolution, what happens is God is active. Right? The absolute nature of the divine call is made known to man through the prophet. Right? The prophet receives the call of God. Right? Whereas the mystic experiences God in, in the sort of interior and then spreads the knowledge, the prophet is uh, a much less interesting and religious person. Right? The prophet is uh, one who uh, is not really religious. It, it, it's the, prophet, the prophet receives everything from God and then teaches. Okay? And our experience in, in this realm is not absolute. Right? It's, it's submitted, it's judged by revelation. And that was the very important word from last week. Revelation, God breaking into the world, God reaching, reaching into <laughs> into His creation, right? uh, and this has to do with history. Right? This is very, very important. Uh, God enters the world in in this monotheistic revolution in in an event, in a historical event. Right, so our examples here are Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. Right? Monotheistic revolution. Um, again, you can interrupt with, with questions. Again, I forgot to say that, but we'd like to, to do that. Otherwise, we'll, we'll get some at the end. Okay. Um, okay, now, what did the Christians do? Um, so backing up to the, the poets and the philosophers, right? at the time of, of Christianity, there were the two strong groups, right? Poets and philosophers. And who did the Christians choose as their friends? Right? Who's going to be their friends? Was it going to be uh, the poets, the ones who came up with the myths and the religions? Right? Or was it going to be the philosophers, right? the ones who critiqued myth, the ones who emphasized logos, right? rationality? Right? And we know from last week that they chose the philosophers philosophers, right? because Christianity uh, upheld that reason was good, that we could use our reason to know that God exists. Right? That's that natural knowledge of God. Right? And so uh, the early Christians were called, they were called atheists right? in, in, the, in the Roman Empire, because they would not worship 
the pagan gods. They were called atheists. And, and they found a lot of help from the philosophers, the ones who were critiquing all of the various pagan cults, the religious cults that were happening. Right? But even though we made friends with the philosophers, well, the Christians went beyond them. Right? Because how could you ever reason to God becoming a man? What philosophy could ever come up with God becoming a man? Or that God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? What philosophy could, could arrive at that? And so the Christians, while they made friends with the philosophers, they moved beyond them. And we see this in St. Paul. St. Paul says, We preach Christ crucified unto Jews a stumbling block, and unto the Greeks foolishness. Right? God became a man in died on the cross. To the Greek, that's, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. <laughs> right? <laughs> that's, that's, that's not going to fall into um, the, way they, the way they understood the world, right? which was, which was a strictly rational. Right? Right? This was uh, a part of Revelation. So the Christians, again, they made friends with philosophers, but they went beyond, they went beyond that. Especially in the writings of St. Paul. Okay? So, just to, um, so just to recap, um, Christianity itself would be, would be here, right? But it takes a little from here and a little from here. Okay? Because that's the way, that's the way Christians uh, become, it's a universal religion, right? There is mysticism in Christianity, right? There's prayer and they're sort of advancing towards God. And there's also enlightenment. We use our reason. We use philosophy. Okay. Now, um, just as a little aside, um, you know, there's sometimes the idea that there's just um, everyone kind of their own path towards God, right? Uh, and that's there's some truth to that, right? Because we're all we're all different. Right? But from a Catholic perspective. There are standards to to judging various religions okay? because of because some of them are closer to what is true and some are further away. Okay, so this is just a little list um, that the philosopher Peter Creek came up with uh, ranking ranking religions as regards. Their ability to teach was true. So he's a Catholic, so of course, Catholicism is first. Mm -hmm. Okay, first place. Mm -hmm. All right, <laughs> not bad. Um, Orthodox here in the Orthodox faith. But he puts it in one, except for the issue of papal authority. Not bad. Okay. Second, Protestantism and any separated brethren who keep the Christian essentials as found in Scripture. And third comes traditional Judaism, which worships the same God but not the Christ. Fourth is Islam, the greatest of the theistic heresies. Okay, so they do believe in, uh, in God, uh, but not the same God. Um, fifth is Hinduism, a mystical pantheism. Sixth, Buddhism, a pantheism without a God. Seventh, modern Judaism, Unitarianism, Confucianism, Modernism, Secularism. So these have no mysticism or religion, but only ethics. Eighth, idolatry, and ninth, Satanism. So that's just uh, that's kind of interesting. I don't have a lot of time to go into it, but um, it's, uh, we can talk about it at the end. Okay. All right. Now, the key component to uh, the Christian faith is what? What separates it from the others? What moves us beyond? Right? Is revelation? Right? Is the idea that God stepped into history? And so uh, the call that God has for each one of us is, well, it's from God. It's not from us. It's from God. Right? The divine call does not well up from within us. Right? It comes from outside of us. And so this is where we hit the pause button on man's search for God. Right? When we take the tape out, maybe flip it around, put it back in, hit play, 
and how we switch to God's search for man. God's searching for man. And this is it's so simple, but it's, it's really profound. Right? Um, in the Old Testament, for the first time, right, God was interested in how they behave. Right? Their moral life. Right? Which the Greek gods really didn't care too much about. In, in, in Israel, the God to be worshipped is also the God who gives moral commands. Right? He gives a he gives a call. Right? This is different from the ancient myths because finally we have ethics and religion right? found together. This is this is this is God giving man a call, not just a a religious experience, not just a cult but actually reaching into our moral life, right? The Ten Commandments, right? which we'll definitely get to. Okay, and this is summarized here in, in the book of Leviticus. You are to be holy to me, because I, the Lord, am holy. And I have set you apart from the nations to be my own. Okay, so this kind of gets us back to the title of today's class. Right? Our call is to be, to be holy. Well, what the heck does that mean, right? We gotta figure that out. Right? We we're called to be holy. And if we were just as holy as this little girl, then this world would be an awesome place, right? Anyone know who this is? Grace in the back. Saint Teresa of Lisieux. Saint, Saint Teresa. Yes, Saint Teresa. I had to put her up here. It's tomorrow. Tomorrow is a day in the church where we remember this this saint, Saint Teresa. And she did grow up. She didn't stay this. Cute forever. Uh, well, she she was always beautiful, but um, Saint Therese, and tomorrow we remember her in the liturgical candle. She was a very holy person, right? She we're all called to be holy, right? Saints are holy, and uh, we don't understand holiness too well until we get to concrete uh, lives. Or right? what do they do? How do they live? What does this mean? Okay. So we're called to be holy. And we see this right in Scripture. For God chose us in Him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in His sight. Right? God chose us in Him before the creation of the world. Meaning that the divine call actually preceded our own stepping into this world, which is pretty awesome. Right? God had thought about you from all eternity. You know, like that, from all eternity, right? You, you have existed and you have chosen to be holy. Okay? And right here in the first paragraph of the Catechism, um, the Catechism opens with this, and with this call for 